is Carly Bogey, and I will be reading today's scripture. And today's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem, the word of the Lord. Right on. If you have your Bibles open to Isaiah 53, we're going to jump right into episode two of Isaiah's Messiah. We're going to be looking at Jesus through the eyes of the prophet Isaiah, who wrote this passage 2,800 years ago, halfway back through the entirety of human written history, what we know of human written history. This goes halfway back. And he's looking forward to an individual coming that will come as Messiah to save us from our sins, to save us from our brokenness, to save us from all the things that separate us from God. Now, one of the things that's really interesting in this passage as we look at this for the next six weeks all the way up to Christmas Eve, and I've been encouraging everyone to read it daily. I read it about five out of seven days, this, so I didn't I completely hit it um, perfectly. But I've been encouraging you to see Christ Uh, the child that will be born as a suffering Messiah, one who would come to suffer for our sins. And so I've been reading that and really encouraging you to dive into it, not so much try to understand it, but to take a deep dive and immerse yourself in the suffering Christ and who he is. And so let me just read this quickly again. And when you think of Jesus, when you picture Jesus, and a lot of the pictures that we see of Jesus are not quite this look. They kind of take a different take, I would say that just G- this Jesus hits a little different, right? This Jesus hits a little different than some of the victorious Jesus that we see on a regular basis. Let me read this again and see if this lines up with who you see Jesus as. One, he was despised and rejected by mankind. That's anthropos. That means all. It's a Hebrew word, actually, but the Greek version of that would be anthropos, which means by all mankind. That includes you, ladies. That includes you, men. It's not just men. To all of mankind, he would be despised. Interesting. Rejected and despised. He was a man of suffering. He was one familiar with pain. Is that part of how you see Jesus? That he was regularly suffering. He was in suffering in his soul and his heart. Perhaps we know in the garden he had anxiety to the point of, of, of blood, uh, sweating blood. Uh, he was uh, perhaps, it doesn't say he was depressed, but he was a man of sorrows, it says. Constantly thinking and usually because of what was going on around him, for the hearts of others and the brokenness of others. Jesus rarely, if ever, I never see it in the scripture, looks at his own suffering and then complains about it. It's usually he's suffering for a reason outside of himself, and oftentimes the majority of my suffering, at least my emotional suffering or whatever would come with that, uh, is based on my experience as opposed to the experience of others. He was suffering often because of others because he came for the brokenness of others. He like one from whom people hid their faces. They hid their faces. Now, back in the Jewish uh, times and day, when someone would walk by you, one of the insults is that you would hide your face from them. You were anathema. You were shunned. You were put away. And we do that in different ways in culture. That still happens today. But it was a way to perhaps cancel someone in the society back then, to remove them from society, to remove your face. And when you walk by them, you would hide their face. It says that Jesus was like that. People would hide their faces from him because they did not want him to give him the dignity of the look or the face-to-face. Luckily, it says in the scriptures that we will see him eventually face-to-face, and he has never hidden his face from us. The face of God will be revealed to us. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. What does it mean to be held in low esteem? They don't think much of you. You're not really of consequence. I play some basketball, and uh, you know, sometimes I play and someone gets on the court and sometimes you can underestimate somebody. You ever done that? Just kind of underestimate somebody? You can overestimate somebody. There's a line in North Shore, the old surf movie from the 80s, that says, I can tell you're a kook. He says, how do you know? He says, I can tell by the way you wear shorts. Uh, all of a sudden, he just was underestimating or perhaps overestimating. Jesus was underestimated, right? Jesus was a person who was underestimated. He was held in low esteem. We don't expect much of him. He did have that one year of popularity, but one year of popularity out of 33 did not equate success. So this is the scripture, this is the context of the Jesus that we're presenting, that the scripture presents. Now here's a question. 
is if Christ was known as a man of suffering, he was definitely known, his whole life was, was marked by suffering, right? He actually ended up a loser in regard to victorious political or whatever uh, historical um, timeline, right? He was killed, he was rejected, everyone left him. Uh, if Jesus is a man of suffering, here's a question, then why are we as believers and oftentimes churches so enamored by success? If Jesus was a person whose entire existence, even to the very end, he's coming back in victory, that's going to be a different story. When Jesus comes back through the East Gate, we believe that that's happening, and it's been 20, another 2,000 years since he was here. But why are we so enamor enamored with success, and are you enamored with success? Say, there's success is a shiny object, right? And it's, it's equated in what we think in our own hearts, what we build up in our own mind, what the culture tells us. What is success? Are you enamored with success? I mean, oftentimes we're just trying to run away from pain. But Jesus entered into suffering. And as we'll see, he entered into other people's suffering. He had this incredible empathy. And not only did he enter into it emotionally, it says that God became man, which is just mind-bending, right? If you think about the Christian story, if you were to tell someone who has never understood or a pagan and never heard the message before, to say that there was a God and he became one of us, that he actually incarnate to become flesh, actually entered into the suffering. Why is there suffering? Because we are built for life ultimately, but our bodies have been tainted with death. And so Jesus, God himself, entered into something that was dying unless it could be redeemed. And that's what he did. I want to be careful that we don't equate worldly success with victory. See, Jesus was ultimately victorious. And we're going to show that even though he was victimized over and over, that he never um, equated his own self-worth, his own identity with that victimization. He never used the victimization to create a narrative, to create power. But instead, in the midst of his victimization, he lived as a victor. And that is so important that no matter what happens, no matter what suffering that we go through, which you'll see Jesus can identify with, it is in the midst of that, by leaning on the suffering of Jesus, by identifying with the suffer suffering of Jesus, who overcame suffering to have victory, then that we can have victory over our suffering. We'll see why that is. Let me just tell you why Jesus came. Jesus did not come to be a victor. Jesus came to identify and allow us to identify with suffering so that we might become victorious. And so once again, the question is this. If Christ was known as a man of suffering, why are we so enamored with success? And why are we so frustrated when our lives don't match up to the success that we think they should? Two points for today. Two points are this. One, Jesus identifies with the broken and the brokenhearted. Jesus does his best work with the broken my voice, like broken right there, was my four, I'm like 14 years old. <laughs> Edit that. <laughs> Jesus identifies with the broken. He does his best work with the broken and the brokenhearted. Let's say today, this is just a message that if you are broken, if you feel that you've been broken, if you are brokenhearted, Jesus identifies with you. And he identifies with you not just because he says he identifies with you. He became incarnate, and he identified with suffering. And, and, and why is this so important? Well, look at that in a moment. Why didn't he come as a victor? Why didn't Jesus come as a, a king or someone who's popular or someone who's well-known? Why, why didn't he come victorious? Couldn't he have done much better work if he had come as a, as a conquering king or somebody that people would follow and look up to? But it's really antithetical to think that he came as a broken and despised person. For someone who is going to redeem the entire cosmos, not just our hearts, but it says he will redeem the entire cosmos, why would you come as the broken? There's a reason for that. So, number one, Jesus identifies with the broken and brokenhearted. And number two, Jesus didn't allow the victimization to define his reality. He didn't allow his victimization to define his reality. Let's jump into the first one. Jesus identifies with the brokenhearted. Why would Jesus come and, and identify with brokenness. Let me say there's one, there's a key reason why Jesus did that. Because if he were to come as the perfect God that he was, and he was perfect, he was fully human, fully man. 
But if he were to come in to have no suffering and to have the fruits of success and never have had a setback, never have had a failure, never have any brokenness, he never could have identified with us. Why? Because we cannot identify with perfection. It would have been impossible for us to identify with Jesus if he would have come as the perfect, victorious Savior with no brokenness. Why? Because we have no road to perfection. So the only way to redeem his broken people is not to create a paradigm which they cannot breach that chasm. Because if he comes as perfect, we would look at him and say, you, have not, you, you, you can say nothing to my brokenness. You can say nothing to where I am. There is no bridge between me and you. You are perfect. I am not. There is no way for me to transcend that gap. But Jesus, minding the gap, stepped over that and became broken. Why? Because in that place, he rebuilds a pathway for us back to victory through meeting us in our brokenness because we could not have met him in any other way. And so the only way to redeem a broken people is not to come as a perfect and victorious King Jesus or who, who, he, you know, who he would be in that realm and as he comes back the second time. But he would come as a broken person so he could identify with us. And it is in that brokenness and him them taking victory over that brokenness on the ultimate brokenness of the cross that all of a sudden the pathway is open. Because when he takes victory, he can say to those captives, come follow me, I have set you free. And he transcends the gap and brings us with it. There is no other way that Jesus could have identified with us. There is no way that he could have saved us. There is no way that he could have redeemed us without becoming broken also. This is why Christ had to come as Isaiah's broken and suffering Messiah. I put, since it is impossible for us to identify with perfect and eternal, God became broken and despised so that he might create a path of reconciliation. Go to verse 3. Verse 3 says, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. As you look at the scripture, and if you don't really look at the scripture, it's other than the cru crucifixion, sometimes you can miss all the suffering that Jesus went through. One, he was actually disenfranchised. Now, we, we, we are adopted as believers, and adoption is oftentimes, always, the redemption of brokenness. If you were adopted, it is a redemption of brokenness. You had a parent that passed away. You were given away. Uh, for one reason or another, there was a brokenness, and adoption, the beauty of adoption, fixes that brokenness. But adoption always happens because of an earlier brokenness, but it is a redemption of brokenness. Jesus himself was disenfranchised from his father, not related, to his, his heavenly father, not related to Joseph at all, and Jesus was adopted. Now, he loved his earthly father, and we thank you for the glory of that restoration of that relationship, and Joseph is a character man of God. But you can see as Jesus speaks that he longs to be back in the presence of his father his heavenly father. Now he says, I and the father are one. And so you have these statements where he's always feeling connected to the father. And I would say if you were to look at the, the, the um, Easter narrative, when Jesus is on the cross, you were told that God turned his back on Jesus. And he didn't turn it on, back on Jesus, but he turned his back on the sin that Jesus had to bear on the cross that we see later on in this passage. But one thing that, this is just my take, as I'm reading through Jesus being on the cross, he never in his statements, the seven statements, he keeps referencing his father, which is interesting. Is it possible that the Godhood, the part that needed to turn from the sin, was able to turn from the sin as Jesus is fully human, fully God, that God could also turn his back to the sin, but the loving father could be with him the entirety of the time? I believe that Jesus never lost connection with his father on the cross. That is why he, at the end he says, Father, into my hands I commit, I commit my spirit to you. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's continually to, to create this reconciliation. But he was adopted. And that's a beautiful thing. Adoption is a beautiful thing. But he was also understood the brokenness of being separated from his true father. True fathers matter. Another thing is this. He had poverty and homelessness. Matthew 8, 20, he said, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And Jesus actually was homeless. He would walk, go from place to place and depended upon the gifts and the benevolence of others to survive. We know that that is true. And there was many women who, and men who 
cared for him and watched over him and gave him and provided for him. He was provided for by human beings. God provided for him. We know that his father. But it was like we talked about earlier in the giving to an organization, the giving to Jesus and the organization that he was creating with those 12 disciples, they cared for him and allowed him to do that ministry. Jesus was a migrant. Did you know that Jesus was a migrant? We have migrant, they would call it a migrant crisis all over the world, right? From South Af from Africa into Europe, from uh, India, Afghanistan, from South America, different places. Jesus had to flee everything that he owned with Joseph and, his, and Joseph and his mother into Egypt, and that is in Matthew 2, 13 and 15. Jesus understood what it meant to be ripped away from his country, to go to a foreign country and to live. He can identify with the migrant, and so should we. Jesus, I would say, for all the political talk about migrants and all the political elements of them, we can have that discussion. Separate of that, the beating heart of God flames a loving fire for those that are dispossessed and displaced. Separate of all of our arguments, we can have those arguments, we can have those discussions. Behind all those discussions is the beating heart of God that is on fire for the dispossessed and those that are displaced. Do, no matter what your thoughts are on that issue, do not lose sight of the fact that Jesus and God loves the migrant and dispossessed. That's where any argument we have needs to come from and start with. He was subject to gossip. How about in uh, Matthew eleven nineteen? 19? Have you ever been spoken against? It says, they said he was a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You know, has, that been, has anyone ever said anything of you that, that wasn't true? Well, part of that is true. He was a friend of tax collectors, uh, and he was a great friend of sinners. So that was a half-truth there, but he was spoken about. Has anyone spoken about you? Has anyone maligned you? Let's say that Jesus can meet you in that brokenness, and he can create a pathway to victory and reconciliation because he understands it. He understands that. It says that he was underestimated. Have you ever been underestimated? John 1, 46, they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? That was a place up in the north and up by the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was seen as a place in, in uh, Israel that was uh, it kind of the, it, it was it was kind of like the low lives lived there, you know. It was kind of a, a group of people that that they were kind of despised. If you can think of different parts of maybe the country or the world where, yeah, those people kind of stay away from those people. They're different. They got a different culture. They hit different. That was where Jesus was from. It says he was from Nazareth, and he pulled all of his people from that region. It's really interesting who G Jesus chooses to work alongside of him. He didn't go choose the the highest of the high and those that are successful. But he went and chose the broken. He was underestimated. Have you ever been underestimated? Someone looks at you and says, oh, you're never going to do it. We don't believe in you. And then you start trying to prove yourself based on that. Jesus never had to try to prove himself. He just had to be obedient. Mother Teresa says that God does not call you to success. He calls you to faithfulness. Mother Teresa says God did not call you to success or to succeed. He calls you to faithfulness. No matter what the haters say, Jesus was faithful to his Father. And if you are faithful to the Father, he will make your path straight and lead you to victory. And victory does not always equate with worldly success. Another one we see is that he was hated by the ruling class, the elite. They hated him. In Matthew 12, 14, they spoke against him. They hated him. They wanted to kill him, it actually says. They hated him so much they wanted him to die. Have you ever had a, a plot for your life against you? Maybe a couple of you have. I don't know, maybe. But Jesus had. There was a hit on Jesus. There was blood money and a hit put on Jesus. Actually, 30 pieces of silver was given. He actually had an, organi an organization that was coming against him that wanted his very life. He was falsely accused. Matthew 27, 12. But it said that he gave no answer. The Pharisees stood and they pointed at him. You ever been falsely accused? Is some of this starting to relate to you? Something you've experienced before in the past? Someone accused you of something, said something about and it just takes you out, he was falsely accused. You know what his answer was? He did not need to defend himself. Why? Because he knew who he was. You know, sometimes the best defense is no defense. I have nothing to say. Remember when Nehemiah, our last series, Nehemiah never had to go to battle because of his proper responses. His responses won the battle, right? And hopefully that works when you, any of these things that you go through, the way we respond sometimes can win that battle. Let's just do a couple more. He was betrayed. Imagine, uh, have you been betrayed? Someone turned on you, stole something from you, cheated on you, broke your heart. 
left you when you were a child? Have you been betrayed? Jesus was betrayed by a close friend, completely betrayed, and betrayed with a kiss. He was physically assaulted, physically abused, and so many people in our society today have been taken advantage of physically. Jesus understood that. He was whipped, he was beaten, he was scorned. Once again, we see that he was physically exalted, and if you've experienced that, Jesus' very body was taken advantage of as well. Finally, he was murdered. Jesus was murdered and crucified on a cross in Mark 8, 31. Now look at this list. And when you think about the Jesus that I've been speaking about, it, it's in your mind of who Jesus is, do you lose touch with the suffering Jesus? Growing up Catholic, one of the things I got to say that they get right, that they get right, is the suffering of Jesus. Like, there's no way to walk into the Catholic church and not understand that Jesus suffered and died. Now, for some that's problematic because they don't feel it goes to the victory enough and you can have that theological understanding. But sometimes I think on the Protestant side of the aisle with all of our, you know, great locations and smoke and mirrors and all the things. Well, they got smoke too. Uh, and a little, little bit of this. Um, in the midst of all that, we miss out on Jesus was a suffering servant. And we cannot have victory until we relate to his wounds. By his wounds, it says in this passage, as we'll get to it in a few weeks, are we healed? Look at this. He was adopted, which is beautiful, but it was brokenness that was redeemed. He had poverty and homelessness. He was a migrant, a foreign migrant. He was subject to gossip. He was underestimated. He was hated by the ruling class. He was falsely accused. He was betrayed. He was physically assaulted, and he was eventually murdered. That's the Jesus we serve. And it is in that, vict- it is in that suffering on the cross, in the moment, the ugliness of the cross, that he took victory. Why? Because three days later, he rose again. And the point of our suffering and only can happen if we relate to the suffering of Jesus. This can only happen to your suffering if you relate to the victory of Jesus. The suffering of Jesus is that Jesus took victory over his suffering. And when, if we follow Jesus, we can take whatever rubble we've had in our lives and we can turn that into victory. Why? Because we took victory? No, because Christ took victory. You see, this is the message that Jesus... You understand me. You have taken victory on the cross. And so now I'm going to follow you into that victory. And we see Jesus following into that victory. I put in your notes this. We often view the world through the kaleidoscope of our pain. Let me say that again. We often view the world through the kaleidoscope of our pain. Often, you know, one of the things that we need to do is instead of seeing the world through our own pain, because if you view the world through the kaleidoscope of your pain, you're going to have a weird view of the world. It won't, come in, it won't come into focus. But if we allow Christ's pain to see our pain through his pain, it becomes clear and focused. Why? Because there's victory in his pain. See, our pain will never lead to victory, ultimate victory, eternal life victory. You might have some victories on earth here. You might get redeemed from a, an addiction and you help other people and that's redeemed. But it won't have eternal victory unless it is equated to the victory that Christ did on the cross. Do you equate your suffering with the suffering of Jesus? Because when we do, our pain can be redeemed. Final, final point. Jesus did not allow the victimization to define his reality. Verse 3. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. I put in the notes, in the summa fabula, which means the summation of Christ's life, he died rejected, he died scorned, and he died alone. It said the women were still at the cross, his mother and and some of his friends, but everyone else had left him. He died rejected, scorned, and alone. If you were to look at Jesus in that moment, you would say that was a horrible job being a revolutionary leader that was supposed to bring life to the world. He failed. Jesus, if you look at his life, Three days later, things turn, right? Three days later, everything changes because he's living beyond the temporal. He's living in that eternal. But if you were to look at his life, success, earthly success, was not the ultimate goal of Christ's life. How did he do that? How did he turn it around? I'm going to say, how do we do it? I want to say, the way that Jesus, as I was looking through this, how did Jesus turn this into victory? Granted, he had the, the victory of, resur- of a being resurrected. So death is the final, is the final um, death. It is the final place of all of our lives. And if you can have victory over death, 
then you have victory and you can backfill it to every other victory that needs to be had. Does that make sense? So the ultimate, the ultimate win for Satan is death. If Jesus can take victory over death, then every, the underpinnings of all of our other suffering falls apart. Does that make sense? Because all of our other suffering leads to death. Death is the cornerstone of all other suffering. And if Jesus can be raised from the dead, then he breaks the cornerstone of suffering and all other suffering tumbles and he takes victory over it. So he was redeemed and our suffering was redeemed by him having victory and being raised from the dead. But how did he do it in real time? How did he do it when you're still on earth, right? When you get that diagnosis, when the breakup happens, when the goal has not been met, when something like this, you know, the things that you want for your life have not happened. I want to say he did it by this. He found his core identity was rooted in relationship to his father. As I looked all week, I'm like, God, what's, but what's the secret for now? <laughs> I get the, okay, after we, we go to heaven, and yeah, it's all going to be great and amazing, but what about now? Like, I live now. <laughs> How do I do this when I'm suffering in this exact moment? How do I not get focused so much on my victimization or my own personal suffering or whatever it is that it just paints my whole life? Why am I constantly drawn to seeing the negative things in my life more than the positive things? I am so good at writing a negative storyline for my life. This is going to happen. This bad. It's always negative. Well, because this body's built for death is why. But how do I do it in the moment? How do I not allow to be steeped in the death and around us? And I've found the world really discouraging lately. It's like super discouraging. And like I just want off this merry-go-round, you know. Uh, like Jesus, come home or take us home or whatever it is. How do we do that? What I found this, and it was found in an answer in John, 109 times in the book of John, the word Father is used. Jesus found his identity in being beloved by his Father. And no matter what happened in his life, he knew who he was, and he knew he had a Father who loved him and who cared for him ultimately. He lived with a lens of belovedness. I realized that's the answer. The answer is no matter what you're going through, to be able to say, but I have a trump card, and the trump card is this. I have a God who loves me. I have a Father who loves me, who sticks by me in all the suffering, in all the pain. And yes, we can look to future hope, and we can look to glory, and we can look to those scriptures that say, you know, the, the sufferings of the moment aren't worth being compared to the eternal glory that will be revealed to us. Yes, but I'm still living here in the moment. It's 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and I'm still here, and the future glory is in the future. In that moment, in those moments of that suffering, to say, Jesus, I know that you can identify with my pain, but I want to identify with your identity. And his identity was of a beloved child of God. And so if you have a practical takeaway, this is, your, it, it, is it for the week. One is that Christ's core identity was rooted in his relationship with the Father. The Father loves the Son, it says in the Scripture, and has placed everything in his hands. And I am beloved. I'll tell you just a, an incredible scriptural truth. This will bend your mind. You'll need to go back and do some systematic research this week and get back to me if, if you don't agree. God does not love Jesus more than he loves you. It's impossible for God to love his son Jesus more than he loves you. Why? Because through what Jesus did on the cross, we get to accept the position of Christ. We are like, he sees us as he sees Christ. And so when God looks at you as the redeemed, as someone who has believed in him through faith, that God loves you the same he loves Jesus. That is so hard for me to take on board. It almost sounds like heresy. Like I'm sitting there, I'm, I'm fixing my hair this morning, which took a lot of extra time. I put a lot of gel on it extra to really patch down these spots here. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, that's heresy. There's no way. He's got to love Jesus more. I'm not Jesus. It's not true. The scripture says that we get to become, because Jesus incarnated and took, and took us and, and, lo and that God loves us like he loves the Son, there's so many scriptures that point to the fact that God the Father loves you in the same way he loves Jesus. And when you can onboard that, when you can onboard that and live in that identity, not in an identity of victimization, which is the world is trading on right now. The more you're victimized, the more power you have in the society. We're trading on that right now. That, it, basing your identity on victimization leads to death. There's no redemption for that. It leads to death, and I already proved why through the scriptures. Basing your identity on a loving father whose son became like us in suffering, died on the cross, 
defeated death, the cornerstone of death, that all suffering would fall away, and seeing ourselves as the beloved child of God in the same way that God sees us as he sees his son will change your life. That'll give you a kaleidoscope when you look through it that will change everything you do. You will get out of bed in the morning with a different understanding. You will meet your pain with a different understanding. You will meet the suffering of this life with a different understanding. And that is how you take victory, by being the beloved of God. Amen?